So hello, my name is Stefan Behlert. I'm one of those guys Ludwig referred to as Lee management. I'm one of the Lee release managers. And I will talk to you or bring to you a little bit of input and news about the upcoming SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 code. And please bear with me, it's a glance into the future. So not everything is set in stone, not everything is final. And there are parts, unfortunately, which I cannot talk about yet, either because they are still so highly discussed that it would be embarrassing to talk about them here, or because they are still under NDA. So in the next 20 to 30 minutes, you will get some general information. We will talk a little bit about what's coming. And then I want to talk a little bit about the challenges on the way that we will see there and how this can, will, or may affect you. So be with me, one or two marketing slides. You see from the, in, from the SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, we have a quite a different life cycle then you're accustomed from the OpenSUSE, so it's much longer. We are talking about 10 plus three years. So every decision we are currently make for 15 will affect us for the next 13 years. What you can also see there is what we have started with Code 12, that we have a yearly release cycle of service packs. That means every year you see a service pack, we had SP2 last year, you are currently waiting for SP3, both on code 12, coming this year. And next year you will have 15 as well as 12, so with pack 4. Looking a little bit at what this means on the products that we have currently running on the enterprise side. You see, we have here SLE 11, which is still under support, where you still get um, updates for. We have SLE 12, where we are currently producing the first red bubble on the slide SP3, and are coming up with SP4 after that. And the bottom row 15 coming and so we will have soon three major code bases running in parallel, being supported for a short time. Let me start with one thing. Um, we plan to have the first customer ship of 15 in the second quarter of 2018. You may say that's a little bit far out. It's not. In fact, it's yeah, 12 months or less. So. We are currently working with high pressure to get all the open things fixed and adapted. There's one big change we have compared to code 12. We will deliver um, the traditional operating server. That means a server that has everything. And we will deliver something that we call SUSE Container as a Service Platform, which is, in fact, um, there to host containers and other stuff in parallel. On the schedule side, you see here, we have in July the code drop deadline. In case you wonder what that means, that's for our partners, our hardware partners, our software partners, to deliver their part, their codes, their hardware enablement patches, whatever they want us there to have inside of Code 15. That means we are working closely together with them currently to get everything there in shape until that. We have then until September time to get everything together for our documentation department so they can update and write and start documenting how code 15 will work. And shortly after that, most likely not all of the documentation will be finished then, but at least hopefully some of it. Um, we will release beta one, which will be the first public beta then that is accessible for everybody. 
In case you're wondering, no, that's not, of course, the first milestone we produce. We have several alphas in between and before, but those are internal only, so we get time to fix everything that is broken, that is not working to our success, full thinking, or that is hindering us. Seven betas, and then followed by a relatively short re release candidate um, milestones, and then in April you will get the gold master, followed sometime soon after that the first customer ship. The gold master candidate, in case you wonder, is for us internally when we want to have everything ready, so it can be shipped, and the first customer ship is then when we have everything ready so even customers and everybody else can really use it, so every mirror has been fulfilled, the download servers are ready, and so on. So now to the part that most likely interests you most. So what's coming on the scope side? Yeah, it's a new major code stream. Ludwig said it early on this stage, everything is getting updated. That means we are really looking at every package for an update. Uh, which is quite a lot. You have seen, I think, in one of the slides from Richard, that Tumbleweed had 10,000 packages. Slee has, on code 12, currently around between 3,000 and 4,000. It varies a little bit depending on the platforms. And with code 15, I expect it to be in the same range. So that's quite a huge number of packages where we have to look at. And everything should work together, of course. On the platform side, um, no big changes there. You see x86-64, S390, uh, little Endium Power PC-64, as well as ARM. Product-wise, the usual, what you have seen on code 12 will also exist on 15. Um, we will also release at the same time juice images as well as CASP. I'm not sure if we have something here about CASP, but I'm pretty sure it will be mentioned in other talks as well, so I will not go into too much detail there. One big change that we want to do is we want um, to enhance the module concept that we've started with Code 12. That means we want to get the installation media relatively small. We want to have more produced in small independent or mostly independent building bricks, let's call it in that, and build out of these then our products. I looked a lot how to find a picture that uh, would show this in a good way, and I admit every picture that I saw and every diagram had its flaws. This one comes close to how it will look like. So we have the common code base that we use for all the products there, one repository where we build all out of it for all the products so they work together. We will build out of that something that's marked here as, as Lean OS, um, in fact, it's our code name for the installation media. And we will build out of that various building bricks, and I call it that on purpose, from which we will then create the various uh, products. And of course, also the modules that are on top of these uh, products. That has, of course, some challenges, and we will come to that later. Packages, systems that we have, well, I told you already we will update everything. A few numbers here on the kernel side, we will use 4.12. Um, on the glib side, 2.26, and on the GCC side, 7.2. You may notice that all of these threes are not yet available in a final stable version, we know that. For some, we expect them to be there with beta 1. Some of these three may not be final yet when we have beta 1, but are in the last phase of their release candidate cycle. So we plan to go with these 
versions because we think it makes the most sense for everybody. So we will be there a little bit ahead of what is stable. You see there are three kind of blocks on the lower end, GNOME 326. And also we will have valence support. So you see we are planning here also for some changes and newer versions and updates. And on the right side, there's the most interesting part because we plan also to replace some defaults that we had. For example, we want to switch from NTP to Crony, which has some challenges. We plan to switch from the SUSE firewall to firewall D, and we are looking currently at the 389DS package system. So there are some huge changes coming, and we hope that those will work out nicely. But those huge changes are also producing quite some challenges that we stumbled over. So you've heard we are currently working out of factory, and SLE 15 is based on OpenSUSE factory. Ludwig said we will fork off at one point in time, and that will be in July, roughly said. I'm not giving out an exact date here because uh, it will depend a little bit on what we have then, how stable we are, and when we will go with stuff that is incompatible and stop, for example, at some versions of packages. Um, but roughly said, it will be most likely mid of July. Until then, we will use everything that we have one uh, in the same way as it is on OpenSUSE factory. It's the same packages, the same code that we use there. Um, we have a few adaptions when it comes to the branding packages and we will all that we have there run on OpenQA tests independent of what is running on OpenSUSE itself, simply because we have some tests there and we want to get everything running smoothly. Of course, bugs that we find will go also back to OpenSUSE factory. Um, we encourage, as you've heard from Ludwig, the people to submit there. Um, we also ask you, as OpenSUSE contributors to submit if you have bug fixes them early enough so we can see and test them and see if there are side effects on platforms that maybe are not tested as intensively in OpenSUSE as then they are on SLEE. And of course, if you're a package maintainer, double project maintainer, help us here with accepting stuff early because the sooner we get everything inside, the better it is, and the earlier we can test it on all the platforms. One thing that's causing me currently a little bit of headaches are dependencies. I'm pretty sure you all have a desktop machine with something that is real, relatively huge installed on top of it, and if you install a new package, it mostly is that package and that's it. But if you use a rather small installation image or installed system and you try then to install stuff, you will find dependencies that are bad, that are not good. Why do we want to get these dependencies away or smoothed or made easier? A simple reason, we have people who want to have a small install system. We also have people who want to run containers and virtual images that are small. And the more packages you add to a system when you do a super in, the more unstable and the more unsecure it gets and the more you have to look for side effects. So we want to keep that relatively small and therefore we did a few tests on such a rather small installation. And please don't tell me that 650 MB is not small. Yes, I know there are people who got it down to 200 MB. I know of one person who claims to have a running system with 50 megabyte. Um, 
Yeah, but we want it to be upgradable. We want to be able to install packages and a few other things. So this was the compromise we had there. I will show you a few examples on the next few slides. Um, one caveat in advance, these examples are taken at random. Each of those uh, should show you a specific problem. Um, note that all the numbers you see may not be valid anymore because dependencies change over the time. And if you follow OpenSUSE factory closely, you can see this. Um, note that the package maintainers are in most cases not to blame because we have dependencies that are there since ages. The oldest one that I found was from 2003. Um, we have dependencies that are there because upstream thought it would be nice to have it. And some of these dependencies made sense at the time they were added. Some made even you know, sense. But of course, not necessarily if you want to be on a small system. For all these three examples, and I took them on purpose, that will come a big thank you to the package maintainers who helped to get the dependency solved. I'm not an expert in most of those, um, so a big thanks for the work they did here. First, you remember I said we want to exchange the SUSE Firewall 2 with the Firewall D. Looking at SUSE Firewall, if you install it on the test machine, nine packages, 41 megabyte. That's not good, I thought, at the first moment. Then we tried to install the Firewall D. Same system, of course. 83 new packages and 106 megabyte. What? I thought 40 was bad, 106, Ugh, not good. I'm pretty sure you can't read all the packages there, you should not. Um, but looking at the package list, we noticed three things that fell out. One was Firewall D wanted to install Mesa on a system that had no X. Ah, oh, strange, okay. Uh, Python G object, yeah. It's clear if you have Python, you get a lot of packages, but maybe uh, there are some things which you can do on the dependency list. Dbus 1, X11, I think meanwhile it's called Python Dbus, Python 2 or Python 3. Um, so you see this is two, three weeks old. Um, all those pull in several dozen packages. And in the end, you have the firewall D and you end up with 106 megabyte. And the bad thing is the firewall D maintainer can't do anything because it's somewhere in the chain that follows up. Somewhere on Python G object uh, on the Dbus X11 package, you simply pull in dozens of other stuff. And that's also where Mesa comes into the play. So the Python maintainers and the firewall D maintainers looked at it, changed a little bit on the dependencies, fixed one or two, changed the require here and there to use something different. And then we retried the same thing, but this time also with, uh, without the mine, uh, recommends. And we had 34 packages suddenly, no longer 80, but 34 and more astonishingly, we were down to 22 megabyte, which is less than where we started from with the SUSE Firewall 2. So that was good, that's okay. If you install with, and that's a typo on the slide, if you install with the minus minus recommends, you get a little bit more packages, quite a lot of more, but that's okay then because that's exactly what, what we expect then from the recommends. But if you install without recommends, then you end up with less dependencies there and less space used than we had before. And all of that simply because the Dbus 1 X11 package was not the best choice there to take. There was some other package that was helpful and that reduced the dependency dramatically. 
Another case, we stumbled over the Java packages tools. If you try to install Java, you sooner or later get this package and it fetches you Lua, it fetches you Python, and that but is not necessarily bad on the space side, if you look, 40 megabytes. But if you consider that you just wanted to install Java and you end up with Lua as well as Python, uh, that's not good. So we looked into the Java packages tools. The Lua is simply because there's one script that changes an, a pass from absolute to relative or the other way around. And the Python, well, the Python is problematic because the Python stuff is there to help people who use Maven to get everything installed there, set up correctly. So Tomasz Schmatal looked into that. He made some changes there, looked a little bit in the Java dependencies. Some of that stuff is already fixed in factory at the moment. Some is currently pending the fix. Um, we are not getting rid of Python because of Maven, um, but it will get better and we will reduce the dependency, dependency chain a little bit. You may say, is it worth it to get it a little bit reduced? I don't have numbers yet because the fixes are still pending, but yes, it's worse because every package really makes a difference. Because at one point in time, the dependency below that package will change again and you suddenly end up again with a big bunch of packages. And if somebody has a good idea how to get Maven support without Python in Java packages tools, speak up and help us there because that will be really good. At the end. Perl scripts are welcome. Um, <laughs> just submit to OpenSUSE factory and it will automatically get there. <laughs> the third one goes to CGK. When I first installed that package on the test system, I was astonished because I suddenly ended up with libqt5 libs. And I was wondering, why do I need libqt5 packages if I want to install GhostScript CGK, which is trust some font support um, for GhostScript. And a little bit of digging into that showed us the reason was simple. There was a requires there on the F2, FT2 demos package. That requires was introduced 2003. And looking why that is needed, and the FT2 demos is really a big bunch of collection for free type tools, also graphical ones, therefore the dependency to libqt5. And it was just needed because in two files, in two scripts, um, FT dump was used. And it was not possible to omit that. So, and that's the case when I said the dependency will grow bigger and bigger the more you have packages. We looked how to switch that. And the solution was that we split it, the FT2 demos package into several sub packages. So now you can simply require the FT dump if you need it and don't need to get all the many applications that you have for free type. <laughs> Um, that require the Qt stuff. So you can now install it without having libqt installed and pulled into. The split is already in OpenSUSE factory for GhostScript CGK. Um, the change is still pending, but once that is done, that is also um, reducing the amount of packages brought into. And it's a good example why it's sometimes a little bit of tricky to find the right package to add as a requires and why it's sometimes very good if you split your package. So if you're a package maintainer and you consider of having everything in one package, think about the dependencies, if it's really needed, if it's useful to have it in several parts 
It's obvious when you have plugins or anything else, but there are also parts where this is not as obvious, but it makes a big difference. Yeah, that's my call for action for everybody. Um, if you see dependencies that worry you, or if you install a package and you suddenly end up with packages where you wonder why is this the case, don't be shy, open a bug report, or look into it, or even better, submit something, uh, because that helps us all to get the distribution smaller, to get the, the stuff, that the footprint, let's call it in that way, that we pull into when we update uh, smaller, and it helps also with maintaining all that stuff. At the same time, if you create a new sub, sub package, please think about the description. There was a long thread on one of the OpenSUSE mailing lists, so I will not go deeper into that. But opening a bug report or submitting a patch to adapt a description is appreciated. And not everybody knows what is in a sub package, so that is also helpful. And one more thing, advertising a little bit here. With Sleet 12, we started to have public, public betas. So while with Code 11, you had to be one of our partners and be in a partner program to join our betas and were hand selected and had to go through an assessment center and what else, um, it was not as bad, but nearly, um, to join. We had in Sleet 12 public betas where everybody could join. And we plan to have the same thing again for SLE 15. You have seen beta 1 will come in September. So you have still time to apply there. Um, we ask for an email address and a few other things as far as I know. Um, go to the URL that's mentioned there. You can also search on the SUSIP main page for beta program. There's everything you need on information. And there's also the way uh, to say, I want to join. And then you can get SLE 15 images relatively soon when every milestone is finished and published, you have access to it. We are happy about everybody who joins there. We are not promising to fix every bug report there, uh, but we try our best to get everything solved to your satisfaction there. And it's really cool if you join there and get these images early enough. So if you're missing something or think something is wrongly configured, you can influence the SUSE Linux Enterprise product and therefore also to a certain degree Leap uh, because Leap will also be based on that. So with that, um, I'm at the end. Uh, we have around one minute left, but if there are questions and answers, I'm willing to go beyond that time frame that I have. You got my attention when you said that you were changing the firewall. And what I'm wondering is, if I have an application that's dependent on using the CLI or API calls to the old firewall, is that going to break my application? That's a good question, and I'm sorry. That's why I asked it. Yeah, no. <laughs> and I'm sorry, I have no clear answer to you yet. Um, we have a script. We are currently looking into the migration path there, what we can do uh, to make the transition easy. Yeah, we, are, it... we are not 100% um, sure if we can cover every case, to be honest. Uh, oh, thank you. But... <laughs> But, of course, join the public beta, and there, I think, if you bring it up, if it's not working, then we will look also in these cases. Because it would be, I don't want to lie to you, we are not there yet that we can for, say for sure everything or every situation is supported. I'm pretty sure not, seeing what some people do with the firewall and a few other of the uh, old stuff. And... In case you ask, I've seen people doing things with a finger server where the finger server was not in, never intended to be used for. So, and we will drop that. In case you don't know what a finger server is, don't ask. It's old stuff from the last century. Um, 
So, yes. Well, no, I appreciated your comment about not wanting to lie to me because it reminded me of an old story about the difference between a car salesman and a computer salesman. A car salesman knows when he's lying. <laughs> so, I'll leave you with that. <laughs> I just sometimes have no clue, but that's all. <laughs> yeah. You wanted to say something? Also related to the question about uh, firewall, the, um, is there any scheduled change with regard to the network management infrastructure in SLE uh, 15? Sorry, I don't. I didn't get the last part. Uh, is there any plan uh, to change the, man uh, the network management infrastructure in SLE 15? Because right now, as I see it, there's basically three solutions that are that basically exists and need to be maintained somehow. You are talking about Wicked, Network Manager and the uh, System, System D, Network, D, D. Network D. Yes. It's not so easy to answer. Um, we will definitely keep Wicked. That's for sure. Um, we definitely plan to keep the Network Manager at the moment. We are nevertheless looking into getting all these three integrated more closely, and especially on the system, the network D side. Um, we see on the upstream side development that's very encouraging. There were one or two years ago still the tendency to use that or to have the main purpose for that only on the uh, cloud stuff. Um, meanwhile, that intentions for it have changed. So we are looking into that and planning to integrate all three, but we will definitely have as main systems, the network D, as well as the wicket. Because for one thing, we don't want to change all the configs in a migration. And the other thing is we currently don't think system D, network D is where it should be, for example, for a server infrastructure. Does this answer your question? And yes, it's a pain that we have so many things. That's why we want to integrate it. More questions? If not, then I'm one minute late, but my architect is used to that. Thank you very much. <laughs>